Welcome to your daily writing habit, episode number 149. If you're writing a book or thinking about it, or maybe you've started writing your book and you're having some trouble finishing it, you are in the right place. I'm your host, Christine Whitmarsh, also known as Christine Inc., I-N-K. Each day, I'm sharing with you the writing habits I've learned over my 18 years as a ghostwriter, book coach, and author. I have found that three things in particular have a huge impact on your success, and they actually have the ability to turn a non-author or someone who doesn't see themselves as an author into an author. Those three things are writing fundamentals, productivity, and mindset habits. Here's today's inspirational quote about writing. I love all insider memoirs. It doesn't matter whether it's truck drivers or doctors. I think everybody likes to go backstage, find out what people think and what they talk about and what specialized job they have. And that comes from the famous playwright and screenwriter, David Mamet. Now, since the live version of this episode is airing on a Sunday, Sunday, September 8th, rather than giving you tips about writing your memoir, I thought we'd kick back a little bit and I'm going to give you an example of a finished product. At the end of the excerpt, I will pose a question, so a teaching question for you that will hopefully help you with your own writing. So today's excerpt, and I just actually grabbed it off my shelf of author books, books by authors who I've helped in some way, shape, or form. Sometimes I help people with book development. Sometimes I act as their editor, as their book producer, ghostwriter. It's a whole myriad of services. So I grabbed an author book off my shelf. Let's see which one I grabbed for today. It is No Fear Allowed, a story of guts, perseverance, and making an impact. And the author's name is Laura Herring. Here is an excerpt for Sunday story time. <laughs> it's called Big Business, IBM, Part One. Sure, we were growing big, but were we big enough to shoot for the big business stars of the time? I'll never forget the day I pulled into the parking lot of IBM in upstate New York. The sun was shining brightly and above me where what I later came to refer to as California blue skies, as I never feel as stress-free as when traveling to California. I sat in the car for a few minutes, savoring the moment of having truly arrived. After all, who in business in the early 90s didn't dream of one day adding IBM to their client list? I was always grateful for the opportunity to present to any company, but IBM at the time was the holy grail of all corporate moves, doing at least 5,000 moves per year. This would be huge. So there I was, sitting in front of Big Blue in all its glory. In my heart, I knew that today was the day I would make that dream come true. I couldn't help but reflect on the rocky stepping stones to this Big Blue day. About three years prior, I sat in this parking lot, nervous but excited about my very first meeting with IBM. I had met a woman from their relocation department at a relocation conference. We clicked instantly, and I asked if I could call on her someday. When someday finally arrived and we met, I outlined our services for her. She said this was exactly the type of program for relocating families that she, and I assume she meant IBM, was looking for. It addressed the emotional needs of the entire family, employee, spouse, and children. My insides were brimming with excitement when she hit me with, let me get my boss. I want him to meet you and hear about your program. <sighs> Not again. I realized that I'd been talking with a non-decision maker who had told me she was in charge of relocation in the company. This is a common pitfall for inexperienced salespeople, believing the people who tell them they have buying power but that didn't make it sting any less. Here I was, thinking I was about to make the sale and add Big Blue to our client list. Her boss was a large man, either that or I remember him that way because I was feeling extremely small, sitting in the office of the largest computer company in the world, having just made a rookie salesperson error. The relocation manager quickly outlined for him why I was there and why Impact Group services were just perfect for their relocating families. My mind was racing and I was more nervous than in any previous sales meeting in my career. I was actually salivating at the thought of landing them as a client, like when you smell freshly popped popcorn and can almost taste the warm, salty kernels melting on your tongue. I tasted a contract coming. It was a delicious moment until... How many employees do you have? 
the big boss demanded, startling me out of my reverie. Puffing out my chest proudly, I announced that we were the largest spouse and family assistance firm in the world with 32 employees. Call us when you're large enough to handle our business when you have at least 100 people. With that piercing dagger jabbed through my pride, the IBM boss stood up and left. I was speechless, and my newfound supporter, embarrassed, every part of me wanted to cry out, we can handle your business now, just give us a chance, I can make this happen. Instead, I thanked the woman who loved what we did and left. The man actually did me a favor that day. He set a new goal for me, grow to 100 employees and have systems in place ready to go when we do sign IBM. Walking down the hall, I felt like Arnold Schwarzenegger, I'll be back. One thing about IBM is that their people moved in and out of positions frequently. Three years later, I invited the true boss of the relocation department to a seminar I gave in New York City, where I shared new trends in relocation. I was grateful that she and many others had actually paid several hundred dollars to come hear me speak. Of course, back in the early 90s, having lunch at the top of the MetLife building was one of the things that could, in, that could entice relocation directors out of their offices to get updates from their business partners and potential suppliers like me. I learned that if I invited and charged people for a day of lunch and learning, they not only showed up, but they usually invited me back to their offices to make formal presentations to the right people, decision makers. I was able to make a sale in 90% 90, 90 of the time in those situations. And that is how we finally landed IBM. That book again, if you want to read the rest of Laura's incredible stories of fearlessness, fearlessness as she climbed the ladder of corporate America from a tiny little startup all the way to a $50 million worldwide relocation company, No Fear Allowed, a story of guts, perseverance, and making an impact by Laura Herring. And I hope you enjoyed this week's Sunday story time. And here is today's study question for you. In her story, Laura seamlessly blended story and lessons without stopping the whole story in its tracks to teach the lessons. The lessons in the story, the way that she presented them, are much easier to remember, again, by not stopping the story to tell the lesson. So the question for you is, how can you bring out the lessons in your life stories using things like dialogue, action, and conflict to reveal those learnings? rather than stopping to state the learnings. So again, how can you bring out the lessons in your life stories using literary tools like dialogue, action, and conflict to reveal the learnings? Be sure and drop by my Inc. Authors group on Facebook so you can get motivation, accountability, book writing and publishing resources, and much, much more. Thank you for joining me here on Your Daily Writing Habit, where I'm helping you write and finish writing an awesome book. And if you know someone else who wants to write an awesome book, I'd love it if you would share your daily writing habit with them. Until tomorrow, happy writing.